My name is James Lewis Kennedy. I prefer to be called Jim. I have Scots-Irish roots. I like to think of myself as an intelligent and driven person. I have a strong ability to work, and I have a developed sense of justice and injustice. I don't usually tolerate nonsense. If my ancestors could speak from the grave, they would tell you of the determination of the Scottish people. Just look at the unabating desire for independence that is still strong in Scotland. My father was a man who did not tolerate stupidity, and although he has passed away, I remember his lessons well. My mother is alive and well, living in Arizona, away from the snow and rain of upstate New York. She lives with her sister, who is also a widow. I talk to her every week. I have a younger brother and an older sister, but they are scattered across the country with their own families and busy lives. Now back to my dilemma. You see, a couple of months ago, I realized that my lovely wife of nine years, Laura Grovesner, has been involved in relationships with other men over the past four years. She seemed to have decided one day that I was not good enough as a husband for her and that her needs were greater than what I could offer her. Now, I'm not one to cry in my beer, so I decided I needed some information, and I received it. From two sources. First source, detective. I paid for an investigation into my wife's extramarital affairs. For my $12,500, I received confirmation that my wife was seeing another man on a weekly basis, some guy named Jason McDonald. She slept with him in hotels, houses that my wife sold, and in his apartment on the outskirts of the city center. We live in Albany, the capital of New York State. Second source, lawyer, armed with information about my wife's activities. I turned to family law expert Leanne Miller, a friend, to tell me that if I divorced, I would be screwed financially. You see, I have two children. Thomas is seven years old and Rebecca is five years old. And New York state courts are especially inclined to grant custody to mothers. It doesn't matter that mothers cheat. No, it doesn't matter at all. Judges in New York are especially eager to award custody to mothers rather than fathers. For the father to get custody, the mother must be a serial killer, or worse. The courts are heavily biased in favor of the mother. Fathers almost always receive little attention. The father's abilities as a parent are almost completely ignored in any trial. Judges would rather give custody to a mother who smokes crack and sells sex than to a father who is a corporate lawyer. It's me, a corporate lawyer. My wife doesn't smoke crack or sell sex, but you get my point. She works as a real estate agent focusing primarily on commercial and high-end properties. Do not misunderstand me. I think in most cases, mothers are probably great at raising children. But I also think that fathers who love their children are also quite suitable for their education. In my case, they are also my children. So why shouldn't I be considered equally qualified to be the one to raise them? No. According to the New York State Courts, I am automatically an asshole and irresponsible. Damn it. My lawyer was able to convey to me a particularly important piece of advice. Do nothing. That's right. You heard me. Do nothing. Because if I do anything to correct my wife's wrong behavior, I will end up being the one who gets hurt. We'll suffer from the judge, New York State family law laws, and a biased court. You see, public opinion and historical precedent say that my wife will expose me in the event of a divorce. New York state law allows her to cheat, and for this, she can take me to task in a divorce. Now, I am a person with liberal views. I believe in justice and fair play. But no, the divorce laws of this wonderful state do not believe the same. They believe that fathers, even those who have been victims, should be even more offended. That is, anyone with a penis and a father. Let's just say they are deprived or, more precisely, cheated. By this point, you are beginning to understand my frustration with divorce laws in New York and the unfairness of the whole damn thing. She can cheat on her lover and receive a reward for it. American justice at its finest. So, my highly qualified and experienced lawyer gave me saggy advice. Nothing to do. Or better yet, do the same thing my wife does. But don't get caught. Because even if my wife's infidelity is discovered... If she has proof of my infidelity, the court has an additional reason to behave indecently with me. God. So where does this leave me? In limbo, that's where. So I walked back to my office from the lawyer's office, closed the door, and moped for the rest of the day. 
How could this happen? What did I do wrong? Why did she do this to me? My feelings of failure plunged me into a deep depression as the realization of the state of my marriage hit me like a tsunami. It came over me and made me feel like I was drowning. I know it sounds stupid, but that's how I felt. I thought over and over in my head about the one statement my lawyer repeated, do nothing. But how can I not do this? And for how long? And when will I know it's time to end it? What will happen then? The uncertainty of it all made me physically sick. I felt empty inside as the realization beat inside my head that my marriage was a farce. My wife used me for her own purposes and deliberately betrayed me and our children. Her sexual satisfaction meant more to her than her marriage and children. Was I making more of it than necessary? Did I just need to calm down and work on a plan? I knew I needed to come up with some kind of plan, but right now I had no idea what that plan was. I'll have to work on this. At about 6 p.m., I returned home and pretended that I was still a happy husband and father. In fact, on the way home, I decided not to do anything, so as not to show that I knew about the betrayal of my wife. This cheater. No, sir. I was going to pretend to be happy, happy, damn happy. And then I was going to the same thing my wife did. If it was good enough for her, it was good enough for me. As they say, as you are to me, so am I to you. Yes, that was my new motto. Damn her. Sorry if I ramble incoherently at times, but it's all burning in my brain, and it's good to talk it out. A week later, I saw a psychologist, and he just looked at me and asked about my relationship with my parents and if I hated my father. I quickly gave up on his psycho Dao and decided that I would do it this way. Put your problems on electronic paper. And so, a few months later, after some introspection and the realization that I had to do something to feel better, to bring some justice to this messed up state of affairs, I found myself in a friends with benefits relationship with a woman with whom I worked. She is a lawyer in the same firm where I work, divorced with two young children in elementary school. Amanda Stewart is a year older than me. She's tall, slim, very fit and beautiful and I just can't understand why she wants to have sex with me. I mean, she could have almost any man she wanted just by beckoning him with her finger. Do not misunderstand me. I'm not exactly a fat, ugly bastard. Quite the opposite. I'm exactly six feet tall. I weigh 165 pounds and am in reasonable shape. I run, ride a bike, and work out at the gym regularly. I have a full head of brown hair. All my teeth are in place. I only wear reading glasses, I'm not hideously ugly, and my wife was actually the one who wanted to start dating me. As I learned from a casual conversation with Amanda, she had given up on the idea of trying to be happy while she was married. Her husband, she realized after much thought, was not the right man to marry. So after they tried to save their relationship, they both decided that they did not want to be married to each other. It did not become known until later in our communication that the father of her children is not her ex-husband. This was the main reason for their divorce. I can understand how this could be a stumbling block. This would be the case for me if I discovered that I am not the biological father of my children. But that's not my problem. Indeed, I did a DNA test on my children. So, I benefit from Amanda's needs. Her needs and my needs coincidentally coincide now. I really enjoy sex with her, and we can actually talk a little after we're done with the good part. She is smart and sophisticated and is the type of woman that a man could really love in an easy way. I don't feel any pressure with her, not the same as with Laura. We don't have much investment in each other, not emotional. Perhaps Laura's relationship with the guy she's sleeping with is the same, but I'm getting ahead of things. I decided that if Laura ever decided to end her relationship with her lover, then I would do the same. But there was no sign that this was in her future. Periodic checks by my detective confirmed that my dear wife was getting it from her lover at least once a week. So I decided that I needed to take STD tests to make sure she wasn't bringing home any unwanted germs. The tests, fortunately, were always negative. Maybe she forced her boyfriend to use condoms, or maybe he just wasn't a hotbed of disease. Anyway, 
I made a mental note to get tested every three months, just in case. Amanda and I always use condoms. Safety comes first. Now I also need to explain one more thing. My wife is Laura Kennedy. At work, she uses the last name Grovesner. She thinks it sounds a little more posh than Kennedy. But let's see. The name Kennedy is almost like royalty in the United States. But the name Grovesner dates back centuries in England, and she considers it of much higher class. This, she believes, could attract more high-end clients to work with the firm she works for. We are both 34 years old, and, as I said earlier, we live in Albany in a very nice area called Pine Hills. Our home is near the university and close to downtown and the Capitol buildings. My commute to work is short, just a few minutes. Laura's office is not far from mine in the city center, but since she often has to be away from the office, she drives to work. I drive a three-year-old Subaru Outback, and Laura has a new leased Mercedes. We lead a seemingly completely ordinary life. We are busy with children, careers, and everything that daily life requires of us. The house is about 80 years old but has been carefully updated and renovated over the years and is a three-story structure in the Queen Anne style. We have so much space in the house that we could literally spend the entire day and never see each other until mealtime. We have five bedrooms and six bathrooms and very little storage space. The basement and third floor have storage rooms, so this makes up for the lack of storage for clothes, Christmas decorations and boxes for Halloween decorations and costumes, and sports equipment. I have a detached two-car garage at the rear of the property that also doubles as storage for gardening tools. Laura is always painting or remodeling something. The small bedroom next to the master bedroom was remodeled, and walls were knocked down to become the master dressing room. We literally basked in bourgeois domestic life and thought that everything was fine with us. Or at least that's what I thought. I was clearly wrong. Laura was missing something. It was a long time ago when I began to add up the little things that one day added up to my suspicions that Laura was having an affair. She was very skilled at hiding it. I mean, when she came home, it was almost impossible to notice any outward signs that she had spent two hours in the afternoon having sex with her boyfriend. We were preparing dinner for our family and talking about our day. We planned to do something together and talked about the schedule for the next few days. It was all painfully ordinary and boring. Maybe that was the point. Ordinary and boring. No emotions. Everything was going well until then until I discovered her other cell phone. I was looking in her purse for her car keys so I could move it since she was blocking the garage door. And I needed to get some things out of the garage, and there it was. The phone was turned off, so I turned it on. It was protected with a six-digit unlock code. I tried several combinations when nothing worked, and after the fourth attempt, it warned me that it would block me from further attempts if I entered a fifth incorrect attempt. I decided I didn't want her to know I was going through her things, so I turned it off and put it back in her bag. I racked my brain for a while, trying to decide why she needed a second cell phone. Every conclusion I came to told me she was hiding something. What it was, and why was the $64 million question? This bothered me for several days. I analyzed every aspect of our lives, our marriage, and our work, to try to find the answer. In the end... I decided not to raise the issue, but to get better information. So that's when I turned to the detective. What they told me was my worst fear. Laura clearly wanted more. She wanted some excitement in her life, and I wasn't the person she wanted that from. I mean, if you're bored, the normal thing to do is maybe suggest a change away from the routine. Start a new hobby, take a trip, volunteer for a good cause, maybe become an active member of society. But no, Laura's solution is to start having sex with another guy. How can I deal with this? I was racking my brain for a solution. The lawyer in me decided that I had to approach this logically and take a dispassionate approach, but that didn't take my children into account. A dispassionate approach would have involved me confronting Laura and demanding that it stop under threat of divorce. But what if she decides she doesn't want to stop? What then? What if Laura decides she wants a divorce and wants to fight for it? tooth and nail, in a protracted battle for control of the children, who will win and who will lose? Well, the lawyer in me can tell you that we all lose. 
except our legal representatives. They win about $300 an hour, while we fight over who gets what, pieces of furniture, and how many minutes we each spend with the kids and on what days and where. No, the children will lose first, and Laura and I will also lose. No, if we break up, it must be on mutual terms and done in such a way that we don't destroy everything around us. So this brings me back to what my own lawyer advised, to do nothing. I thought about this for several weeks, all the while trying to understand why my wife decided to have sex with other men. What were my shortcomings? Did I pay enough attention to Laura? Has romance disappeared from our marriage? Was I too boring and ordinary for her? Was I bad at sex? Self-doubt was killing me. But while I was trying to figure this out, I decided I needed to step up my game a little. I had to do something. What exactly this something included was not immediately obvious at the time. But I made a start. I usually try to work out two or three times a week. But with all the increased stress, I knew I needed to increase my workouts. So now I run a lot more than before. I get up at 5 a.m., put on my running shoes, and hit the running trails in our area. In the last two months, I've lost about eight pounds and about two inches from my waist. I also started using the gym, which luckily is located near my office. Two days a week, I go there and work out in the gym. I had a couple of sessions with an instructor to get me off to a good start and make sure I didn't hurt myself in the beginning, trying to lift too much weight. I started with lighter weights and gradually moved up to heavier ones. It's been a slow process, but I'm starting to see an increase in upper body strength. If I was now unattractive to my wife, I wanted to try to improve my attractiveness. Wanting to show her that I was worth paying attention to, I tried to invite her to romantic dinners, just the two of us. But her damn cell phone kept ringing and beeping, ruining the atmosphere. I tried to give sexy massages in bed with warm oil, candles, soft music, and wine. Again, that damn phone ruined everything. I tried to turn the damn thing off. But when she caught me, she complained that she might have missed an important call or email from a client. Everything I did failed miserably. So we all settled into a new routine. And I have to admit that even this has become routine and boring, at least for me. I mean, what's the point? Laura and I keep secrets from each other. She dated Jason regularly, and I began a revenge relationship with a woman who until a couple of years ago, had been a constant cheater. So any idea that I had the moral high ground was now a myth. I was just as bad as she was. But somehow it felt right. A few months later, after Amanda and I spent a lazy afternoon enjoying sex, we had a conversation. We always treated each other with respect. But some days we both wanted the kind of sex that was hot, sweaty, and urgent, and without all the foreplay and lovemaking stuff of people in committed relationships. We were just having sex, we knew it, and we stuck to the plan. It didn't mean that we didn't talk and that we didn't really care about each other. I took care of Amanda. At heart, she is a wonderful woman and a wonderful mother. But we both knew that our arrangement was not long-term and would not develop into anything more than meeting our immediate needs. My plan was to keep my life simple, or so I thought, in six months. So things continued to go much the same as they had for the past few months. I continued to have the detective agency check periodically to see what Laura was doing. She still had sex with her lover once or twice a week. With this knowledge stored in the back of my mind, I decided that I would not rush to complete my extramarital activities with Amanda. In fact, Amanda and I have become a little closer over the past few months, so much closer that she has met my children and I have met her children. At home, at dinner with the kids on Thursday night, Laura told me she was going to a convention in Las Vegas for a week. It was billed as a national event for realtors to come together, exchange information, learn what's working in the industry, and update everyone on changes in laws that affect the industry, and perhaps the best ways to sell homes and abandoned buildings that no one needs. In reality, they had a meeting at a luxury resort with a huge pool, partied until they dropped, got together late in the morning when they were very hungover, drank several cups of coffee, pretended to pay attention to some pointless and boring PowerPoint presentation, and then we were planning the day of the party. Her real estate conventions were always thinly disguised, weeks of parties. I knew this one would be no exception, so I decided it would be a good time to change things up a bit. 
Who am I trying to fool? Laura was a smart woman and clearly understood what she was doing. She didn't just wake up one day with the disease of stupidity. She is an adult and knew the risks and rewards that led her to the decision to cheat on our marriage. This convention coincided with spring break from school. We talked about taking the kids to Disneyland in Florida, but somehow that was completely forgotten when the convention conveniently showed up on her calendar. My frustration with her increasing selfishness and lack of concern for her family showed through. I thought you agreed that we would go to Disneyland this year. My expression totally said that I was disappointed in her decision to go to Las Vegas when we had already planned to take the kids on a spring vacation. This is really important to me, Jim. Besides, Becca is still too little to go on some of the rides her brother can go on, and you know that if she can't do everything he does, it will only will cause a quarrel. Wait, we can deal with Becca if we explain everything to her. She's a very smart kid and she understands everything about safety. I really don't understand why you're putting another real estate convention before your family. She sighed heavily and annoyed while rolling her eyes. The company wants me to go, and they already booked the flight and hotel, so I don't want to talk about it anymore. I'm going to the convention, period. The rest of the evening at home was very quiet. After the kids went to bed, I took a long, hot shower and went to bed with a million thoughts on my mind. I didn't sleep well that night, but I had an idea. Some fundamental justice, as I saw it. So, a couple of days later, I talked to Amanda and proposed the idea of her and our kids, and I going to Disneyland in Florida together for a short vacation. I didn't tell Laura anything about this. After some conversations about logistics, Amanda and I agreed that we would do it. So we booked plane and resort tickets and made a few phone calls to get everything set up. Laura had barely walked out the door to the airport before I started gathering the kids and getting them ready. To say they were excited would be an understatement. I told them we would keep it a secret from Mom for now, and they smiled those beautiful baby smiles and nodded in agreement. So the day after Laura went to party by the pool in Vegas with all the horny real estate agents, me, Amanda, and the four kids were already on the plane to Orlando. One of the airlines had a direct flight that took just under three hours. With little effort, by mid-afternoon, we were in the warm sun, and the kids were running around in their swimsuits, enjoying playing in the pool. This was a radically new experience for Amanda and me. Our time together until now had been mostly limited to fun in bed. Our kids had met before, it was on a Saturday in downtown Albany, and we met by chance. We ended up having lunch together, and the kids got along well with each other. Lunch was at a snack bar with a play area, so the kids could use up the sugar. Amanda and I discussed a lot more than usual. She shared with me more details about her marriage and the path to destruction. She also shared her commitment to children. After the divorce, she realized that she had made some very serious mistakes, but she wanted to be a good mother. She loves her children very much and wants the best for them, and tries to provide it for them. I shared more about the betrayal I felt after learning about Laura and her cheating with Jason. I could see how she listened intently even as she watched her children. I tried to watch her face to understand what she was thinking. She was in full lawyer's uniform. She had to tell me some things that she was thinking. You know, Jim, the life you lead now is very similar to an open marriage. You just haven't told each other about it. Are you sure you want to live this way? I looked at her. I haven't dealt with this yet because honestly, I don't want it to ruin the lives of those two kids over there. I don't want to become a father who only sees his kids on the weekends and spends time with them. Just a few weeks out of the year, everything I've read tells me that the biggest sufferers in divorce are the children. I can't risk that. At least not yet. I took a deep breath because I hadn't been breathing for the last minute while I was speaking. I knew that eventually Amanda would want to move on from our FWB relationship. That's just the way she is. In my mind, I knew she wasn't a big fan of monogamy. I mean, her history said that she loved sex and with different men, over time. I thought that the longer we continued our relationship, the more likely it was to end. She will want to move on to a new FWB. 
but she didn't. And here we are, in the happiest place on earth, with four children pretending to be one big family. I booked two adjoining rooms at the resort. One room had two queen beds and the other had two bunk beds for children. I had to pay a little extra to have the resort provide the rooms I wanted and sort out the beds, but it worked. It's amazing what a little money can do to make this happen. We spent the mornings and early afternoons walking around the huge park and visiting as many attractions as possible, and when the kids were tired and overheated, we returned to the hotel to cool off in the pool. By the time dinner came, the children were ready for bed. This meant that Amanda and I could enjoy time alone, and we would usually share a drink and some food, and then each other. Five days at Disneyland were great. The kids saw everything, including a day at SeaWorld, and did everything they wanted, and were sad to leave as we headed home and then back to school. I needed to get back to work. Amanda needed to get back to work, too. Laura, well, she was on her way back to her normal routine. Laura showed up later that day after the kids and I got home. She had a sunburn and a terrible headache. All this fun was catching up with her. The kids were excited to tell her that they had been to Disneyland and SeaWorld, and when she looked at me, she expressed her disapproval, saying that she wanted us to go there as a family. What the hell, Jim? I thought we agreed to go to Disneyland as a family. Why the hell did you take them there without me? Well, you may remember that we discussed this, and you made the decision to give up your family for another week of partying in Vegas. If we're not important to you, well... Too bad. We went without you. We're having fun. We had a great time. I hope Vegas was worth it. I left the room before she could say anything else. Too bad, I thought. She spent six days having sex with her boyfriend in Vegas. I had five days of great sex with Amanda. I reminded her that we promised the children last year that they would be able to go during the school holidays. Her going to a convention in Vegas at the same time wasn't something I wanted to disappoint the kids about. It's a shame she missed it. She chose Vegas over family. Her loss. On Monday, I returned to work and was busy. It was two weeks before I was able to see Amanda. She had to leave for clients. And I thought that this might be her way of finding an emergency way out of our relationship. Maybe staying with me and four kids at Disneyland for four days was too much for her. But that was not the case. Amanda sent me several messages to say that her kids really enjoyed their time at Disneyland, and she did too. The next time we met, there was a noticeable change in the way we interacted. Little things. I noticed that she became more relaxed in her behavior when we were dating. In bed, she wanted more love. She would put her hand behind my head and run her fingers through my hair. Urgent, sweaty, sheet-tangling sex turned into a more loving relationship. We were still putting a lot of effort into pleasing each other, but somehow that was changing. When it was just the two of us, Amanda called me, darling and sweetie. Nothing has changed with Laura. The latest report from the detective confirmed what I already knew. Laura was still meeting with her lover on schedule, so I decided that I would stick to my schedule. Do not misunderstand me. I was still having sex with Laura. We were on a pretty strict Saturday night schedule. But Laura seemed to take every opportunity to invite someone over to our house or offer to do something, and then later that night say it was too late for sex and that she was too tired. Too often I would get just a kiss on the cheek, and that would be it. So the result was that we had sex maybe once a month, if at all. I tried to pretend to be an understanding husband, but in the end, my patience level was very low. Laura started this journey, and I was good at anticipating potholes in the road. Eight months later. So, there have been several changes in my life. Wow, it really happened. There are so many changes that I don't even know where to start. Okay, first big change. Laura announced to me about seven months ago that she was pregnant. She dropped the news on me about a month after the Vegas convention. I am almost 99% sure that I am not the father of this child. She and I had had so little intimate contact in the months leading up to this that the likelihood of me being the fertilization donor for this child was minimal. However, my plan was to wait until the baby was born and take a DNA test. 
The local lab here in Albany will give me results within 24 hours. Laura is now heavily pregnant, and although she is still working, she has greatly reduced her hours. She still sees her boyfriend every week. That hasn't changed. If DNA tests confirm my suspicions, I hope he has room in his studio apartment for Laura and their baby. I visited my lawyer again after Laura told me she was pregnant and considered my options. A DNA test to confirm parentage was important, otherwise I would likely be required to provide for the child for many years. It seems that New York state law states that any child born while a man and woman are married is automatically considered to be the result of that marriage. Therefore, the law considers me the father, unless I prove otherwise. So a DNA test immediately after the baby is born will be high on my list of priorities. My lawyer suggested other arrangements after the baby was born and paternity was confirmed. More on this later. Laura, I'm in a deep hole. I'm pretty sure I got pregnant in Vegas at a convention. There was a guy there that I had met at other events, and I had always wanted to reach out to him but never found the courage. This year I let alcohol and my own poor judgment take over, and I had sex with him. Three days. It was a mistake. This compounded my previous mistake of forgetting to renew my contraceptive prescription last month. I thought it would take more than three months to get pregnant without the pill. At least that's what the literature that came with my recipe says. In very fine print, it also says that in rare cases, women taking this pill may get pregnant faster. It seems I was a rare case. When the baby is born, it will be clear to Jim and everyone else that he is not the father. Crap. Now what should I do? My husband will abandon me. He'll probably kick me out the door. I guess I deserve it, but still, we are family, and I deserve some attention too. I will fight for my children and threaten him if necessary. I want us to remain a family. If I can convince Jim to forgive me and be a father to this child, just like that, like our other children, maybe we can get through this. Maybe. Should I confess now or wait? Jim and I had sex a few days after I returned from the convention. I need to go to the toilet. This baby is constantly putting pressure on my bladder. Amanda, I learned a big lesson from my short marriage to Mikhail. His new wife, Rebecca, benefited from my stupidity. She waited and watched as I self-destructed, and then she came in and claimed Michael for herself. She was patient and careful, and in the end she won. So I decided to follow her example. It seems that Jim's wife, Laura, has allowed what is between her legs to control her brain. Mine used to do the same thing. Then I became smarter. So I decided to wait, and when the time comes, I will make my move. I wanted a husband, a man I could belong to, and I was willing to remain faithful to him. Jim was everything I wanted in a husband. In many ways, he is very similar to my ex-husband, Michael. His sense of loyalty to those who are loyal to him is strong, and he wears his sense of duty to his children in plain sight. Maybe it's his Scots-Irish heritage. However, I decided to wait and see if his wife burned the marriage down, and if she did, I would be ready to make my move. Well, now was the time. You can criticize me for my past, that's fair, but I've learned my lesson and really need a new life with a man to be my wife. I'm not saying that I've now become an ideal person. That's not true, of course. But I have changed. I decided last year, as I started to get to know Jim better and see who he really was, that he could be the one. A trip to Disneyland with all the kids was the event that made me make a plan. I didn't really have to do much. All I had to do was wait, hint to Jim in subtle ways about my feelings for him, and prepare for the next step. My children have already asked me if Jim's children will be their new siblings and if Jim will be their father. What could be clearer? Jim. Laura called me at work to tell me her water had broken. I hurried home, grabbed my hospital bag, called to make sure the kids would be picked up after school, and we headed to the hospital. The birth of the third child is usually much faster than the first or second, the doctor told us. He thought the baby would be big, so he shouldn't expect a quick birth. Well, the doctor was wrong. Labor and delivery went faster than expected. From the moment we arrived at the hospital until the baby was born into the world, only a couple of hours passed. Yes, girl. And she was such a surprise. 
The doctor who delivered the baby was amazed as he handed the baby over to the nurses to clean, weigh, measure, check all airways, record all vital signs, and wrap the baby in a warm blanket. The doctor tried to watch my face closely as the nurse handed the baby to Laura. My suspicions that I was the father of the child were immediately confirmed. Laura took her daughter in her arms, and the look on her face when she took a good look at the child is something I will never forget. She looked at the child and then immediately at me. I guess the look on my face said it all. My face was blank. My lips were pressed tightly together, and now I was faced with the truth. I heard Laura's deep sigh as she realized her infidelities had been discovered. I turned and left the room. I heard Laura calling me, but I ignored her. I went to the nurse's desk and asked for forms to fill out my birth certificate information. I filled out the forms carefully, making sure to include Laura's name and date of birth along with all other information. When I got to the father's information, I entered unknown and left it that way. The nurse took the forms from me, checked them briefly, and when she got to the father section, she looked at me. I just nodded to her and left the hospital. I never came back. Two days later, Laura and her baby arrived home thanks to her friend Kelly. She was damn curious to know what the story was. She was rather silent as she helped Laura bring the baby and her bags into the house. When she saw me, she didn't say a word. She just nodded at me, as if to say, It's your problem now. Good luck. I left Laura alone for most of the day, and by the time the kids were supposed to get home from school, she found me in the home office and asked, So what do you want to tell the kids when they ask about the baby? I sighed. Tell them whatever you want. Laura didn't know. But I went to the real estate office where she worked and talked to an employee. I knew that she went with him to a convention in Vegas. After some direct discussions between us, where I almost accused her of cheating on her husband in Vegas, she reluctantly told me the name of the man Laura spent most of her time with. Armed with this information and a warning to her not to tell Laura that she told me everything, otherwise I could easily share with her husband any information about what they did in Vegas. I know, it's not too high on the scale of ethical dilemmas, but it was all I had at that moment and it worked. Returning to the first problem, what to tell the children when they ask why their new sister is such a dark skin color. I started thinking about a plan for my kids and me. Part of me wanted to publicly accuse Laura in front of everyone as a traitor, but I knew I didn't need to do that. She will do it herself. As soon as her family and mine see the child, it will become absolutely clear that I am not the father of this child. What then? I called one Mr. Glenn Duncan, a real estate agent in Houston. Duncan was now well-known in the Houston area. He used to be an NFL player. He spent most of his time in the NFL on the practice squad or bench. His actual time on the field was very limited, but to those around him, he could be considered a Super Bowl winner based on his stories. For football fans, your knees are your most important tool, and when they fail, your career is virtually over. And so it happened with Mr. Duncan. Duncan was a large man, standing over six feet tall and weighing about 220 pounds. He was still in shape and looked good in an expensive suit. His photo on the agency's website showed him at his best with a wide smile. He did well in the real estate business and used his NFL history to impress clients and close deals. Well, he was about to face a new deal that he didn't like. I called Mr. Duncan and I can say that overall our conversation did not go very well. When I asked him if he knew Laura Grovesner, he acted stupid and said he didn't know anyone by that name. Additionally, he couldn't remember if he had been to the Vegas convention last year and that he was very busy and had to go. As a parting comment, I told him that Laura would contact him about her newly born daughter and that I would request a forensic DNA test. There was dead silence on the phone. I also asked Mr. Duncan to confirm his home address and telephone number so that the court order could be served. At that moment, the telephone line suddenly went dead. Of course. You'll see Mr. Duncan has Mrs. Duncan and three little Duncans at home. It is unknown how many more he has scattered around the country. So to sum it up, I have a long-time cheating wife who got pregnant by her conference lover 
and had a mulatto child. My kids are a little confused that their new sister has a much darker skin color than them, but in their childhood innocence, they aren't too bothered by it. I'll have a little explanation for them in a few weeks. Now I have a job with Laura. Our future together may be in doubt. Laura. Well, I'm definitely in big trouble. I need to talk to Jim and see if we can get through this. He is usually a very reasonable man, and there is no reason why he couldn't be a father to this child just like before. He will see that in time he will be able to accept her as his own. I'll probably call Glenn to let him know it's a girl. I talked to him after I found out I was pregnant, but he didn't want anything to do with me. He literally hung up on me and even suggested that if I tried to contact him, he might take some legal action to stop me. This is truly remarkable. A man claimed he loved me in Vegas when he had sex with me. He has a really big private area, but that doesn't help me at all right now. Jim has been avoiding me as much as possible since the baby was born. He handles our children quite well, but refuses to touch the baby. When a child cries, he just looks at me for me to do something. In fact, after he puts our two older ones to bed, he spends most of his time in his office. Jim moved out of our bedroom. He moved his belongings into a closet in the spare bedroom on the third floor and moved all his toiletries into the adjacent bathroom. He put the crib in the master bedroom where I still sleep. I know that in a few weeks he will calm down and want to talk about it. He will also want to start having sex again. I'm going to get back into the gym and get rid of any remaining pregnancy weight. When he sees me naked, he will want me, and we will go back to normal. Jim spends more time outside the home with his children. He says they walk a lot in the park. The children come home excited and want to tell me about what they saw and did. I'm here almost day and night, taking care of the baby. I need a shower. Amanda. I learned an important lesson in my marriage to Michael. Just when you think you've won, you've lost. Michael's new wife, Rebecca, was patient and waited for me to screw up. And when I did and didn't fully understand it and take action, she took action. That's why she is now married to a wonderful man and has two children with him. They live somewhere in Scotland, in the mountains, somewhere by the ocean, I think. They love country life and live on a fairly large property with an old house that they are slowly renovating. So, not wanting to be an example, I waited for Laura to screw up. And she did it, and big time. It was time to make my move to the man I wanted. I learned to keep my legs together for all men except the one man I wanted, Jim's. I knew that he was, first of all, a good man, a good father, and wanted to be a good husband. Too bad the woman he married cheated on him for years. It was easy for me to spot the signs of her infidelity because I had made the same mistakes many times. My children were fathered by my two lovers, not my husband. That's why Michael is now another woman's husband. I won't make the same mistake again. I tried to be emotionally close to Jim as well as physically close when we were dating. At work, I went to his office when I had... There was time, and we dined together more often... There was tongues wagging at the company. Everyone knew that Laura had an affair and gave birth to a daughter who was not Jim's. Everyone was quietly speculating when the divorce would happen. Every time Jim left the office on personal business, glances were exchanged between the employees, trying to find out what was going on. Maybe it's day, maybe the end of his marriage is near. His personal lawyer's office was only a few blocks away, so it was normal for him to walk. There and back. It gave him time to think and relieve some stress. He trained himself to send me a message when he went to a meeting. I was always waiting to see what would happen next. I knew Laura's end was coming. Jim. So here's the thing. I thought for days about the great question. What the hell should I do with a wife who had a child with another man? A wife who cheated on me for years and now really rubs it in my nose in a very public way. My brain was screaming at me to get some boxes, fill them with all her stuff, and put them and her and her baby outside. While this might have been the most satisfactory solution, I knew it wasn't realistic given that the kids would be asking questions, and I didn't want to be the one who had to provide the answers, not yet. And besides, I'm not a completely soulless bastard, although I want to be them. But I needed to do something. I had a pretty good idea of what it was, but I also knew that doing it would be painful for my entire family. 
Laura's father quietly told me to do what I thought was right, no matter what I decided. He couldn't believe his daughter was so stupid. Laura. My parents live near Albany, and they were excited to come and see their new grandson. When they walked into the master bedroom to see the baby in her crib, both my parents were surprised. That was putting it mildly. My mother covered her mouth with her hand, stumbled back and had to sit on the chair next to the crib. My father simply looked at me, shook his head in disgust, and walked out of the room. Dad walked down to the bar, poured himself two fingers of whiskey, and sat down at the dining room table to drink it. He didn't move when Mom and I came down a few minutes later. I held the baby in my arms, preparing to breastfeed him. Mom looked at Dad and he poured her a drink and pushed it across the table towards her. She took a long sip and then they both looked at me. I decided it was better to tell the truth, but maybe not the whole truth. This may be too much for them today. So, I admitted that I had sex with a black man in Vegas last year. My dad made a remark that he almost mumbled, not everything that happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Although this was true, it was unnecessary. My mother asked the obvious question right away. What are you and Jim going to do now? I exhaled before answering, I don't know. My mother looked at the table as she asked, Are you leaving it? My head shot up. No, she continued. Is he kicking you out? We haven't exchanged more than a few words with each other since the baby was born. He spends as much time with the kids away from home as maybe. He moved into the spare bedroom, the one I was going to. Use for a child. That's why the crib is in the master bedroom. My mother shook her head. My father just looked at the table. Neither of them even breathed. My mother summed up her thoughts by saying, God, how could you be so stupid? I thought we raised you better than this. Her comment was a statement, not a question. I sat without saying a word while the baby drank from my breast. My mother put the question squarely in my head. Will Jim make me leave. I hoped he would listen to reason and become a father to this little girl. But I knew that every time he looked at her, he would be reminded of my infidelity. It was quite obvious that I had cheated on him. We didn't talk about this at all. He avoided me at every opportunity. And I couldn't blame him. What man would want to be reminded that his wife got pregnant by another man, and this is the result of this affair? It's not like I had a long-term affair with Glenn. He was well-known in the business and was a very personable guy who always knew how to compliment women. This time I drank too much and ended up in his hotel room on the first night of the conference. We spent the next few days having sex and it was wonderful. All the usual household chores, work, children, husband were forgotten, and I just enjoyed the attention he gave me. He had good sex. At the end of the conference, I went home, barely able to walk. I was already very tired, and I knew that I needed to get myself ready for the flight and then get ready to meet Jim and the children. When I got home, the kids were quick to tell me that they had just returned from Disney World in Florida. I mentioned to Jim that Disney World was something I wanted to do as a family. He looked at me and said, You really need to be there for this, and walked away. I didn't know what the hell to do. I had a bad hangover and couldn't take a shower to wash away the knowledge that I might have really screwed up in Vegas. I had too much of a fight with Glenn. It was all about alcohol and the part of my brain that loves sex. The rest of my brain, the part that knows I have kids and a husband, was marinated in a martini. I realized that I had spent at least four days having fun with Glenn. He's a guy who's pretty confident. When I returned home, I realized that I needed to have sex with Jim as soon as possible. I thought it might heal the rift between us. A rift that has been growing for some time. Maybe he knew about Jason too? I know that Jim and I haven't been very close to each other lately, and that's reflected in our family life. At the time, I thought spending more time with Jim and the kids should be a priority. After a few weeks, I lost my period, my breasts became very sensitive, and I started feeling sick in the morning. I knew I was pregnant and decided I needed to figure out a plan. I should have had an abortion, but I didn't. I silently prayed, Lord, let this child be Jim's. But that's not true. Jim, to answer the obvious question of what the hell should I do, I decided that visiting my lawyer might help me better understand what problems I was facing. 
You see, my brain was completely convinced that divorce from Laura was my only option. I would have a very hard time accepting being the father of her child when it was clear to everyone that she had gotten pregnant by another man. A biracial child with two very white parents is pretty obvious. At first, I thought the father might be Jason, the guy she slept with regularly. Clearly, it wasn't him. She cheated on him, too. I had to chuckle to myself for that. I know what you're thinking. This is the 21st century, and my position seems extremely racist. It has nothing to do with race. This is due to the fact that my wife became pregnant from another man. The child is innocent of this. The child has no choice of parents. His mother and father are who they are. Not because the mother is white and the father is black, there is no question about that. The question is that my wife had a child from another man. In my mind, it's very simple. My lawyer asked if DNA tests had been done, they were carried out, and I reported the results. I also handed over the information my detective had gathered about the child's father, along with photographs. We then had a serious conversation about New York State family law and what it meant to me. Especially now that it has been so clearly proven that Laura had a sexual relationship with another man while we were married. I told Leanne that my first priority was my two children. I wanted full custody and was willing to do anything to get it. I was prepared to say that Laura was unfit as a mother. To use all the evidence my detective had collected. And thus custody should go to me. I was wealthy enough that I could afford to fight this battle if necessary and hire a part-time nanny to help with after-school care. There were several court precedents allowing this to be done. I will retain ownership of the house and happily pay Laura half of its value. The kids and I will stay in the house as it will give them more stability and allow them to stay at the same school. The youngest was now going to school, so after-school care was the main problem. I covered it well. I didn't even raise the issue of alimony from Laura. All I wanted was for her to pack her things and her baby and leave. To begin the process, Leanne suggested starting with a formal separation agreement. Now, for those who are not familiar with what this agreement is, it is a legally binding document that is essentially a preliminary step to the actual divorce. I guess you could say it allows the spouses to live separately for a while and decide if they want to save the marriage. The truth is that most separation agreements become a template for divorce because few couples actually return to marriage. I think this is really a scam in stages. I wasn't sure the separation agreement was what I wanted. I thought the separation agreement facey was simply delaying the inevitable. Why waste the time? Leanne felt that using a separation agreement would be a good way to see if the child's father was willing to accept the child as his and provide for him financially. In addition, with the separation announcement was a way to evict Laura from the house and give the children and I a chance to see how we managed on our own. I would happily allow Laura broad rights to see the children. I'm guessing the challenge for her will be taking care of her baby and children every weekend on her own. Over the past couple of years, Laura has largely left all the parenting to me. Her job and her extracurricular activities with Jason meant that she would come home to the three of us tired, hungry, and wanting to catch up on work. She would often go out in the evenings to meet with potential clients or show someone the house. Some weeks, the actual amount of time we spent together as a family was practically zero. So over time, I took care of the children they became less dependent on their mother, and we all moved on with our lives. Laura and I have barely spoken to each other since her baby was born. I made no effort to care for the child's needs. It was entirely on Laura. So on a Friday night, about a month after the baby was born, I started. I took out a large envelope and told her in my very controlled voice, Laura, we need to talk. The expression on her face spoke for itself. She paled a little and realized that this was serious and that this would not end well for her. I knew she was hoping that the longer we put off talking about the baby and her cheating, the more likely I would be to ignore the fact that she had a baby with another man. I poured her a glass of wine and pushed it across the table towards her. I had a glass of ice water for conversation. I had a brown envelope on my desk, and she was looking at it as she took a sip. 
She nodded toward the envelope and slowly asked, What do you have there, Jim? I got straight to the point. This is the separation agreement that my lawyer has prepared. I think it's time for us to think about the future. I think you and I need some space so we can evaluate what we want. And obviously, our marriage is not in a good state. It seems that I am not the person you want for a husband. And now you are not the woman I want for a wife. So, I think that for both our good, we should separate and reevaluate our marriage. Laura's eyes were wide and her hands began to shake. She took a long sip of her wine. I continued, My lawyer prepared this agreement, and it says that I will stay here with my children, and you and your child will move out. You have a month to find a new place to live. You can take as much furniture from the house as you like. You can spend as much time with the children as you want, but they will live with me. I have arranged for a part-time nanny to help with child care after school, and in case I need to go away, I've arranged for work about adjusting my schedule and will be able to work from home much more. Laura's face showed shock. I clearly surprised her with this separation agreement, and she needed time to think about her options. Jim, why do you want me and the baby to leave? The expression on my face said it all. It's time to be frank. Come on, Laura, be realistic. You decided to cheat, then you got pregnant, and now you want me to just take it for granted. Nope, it won't work. You should have realized by now that I was not going to tolerate that level of disrespect. You've been unfaithful to me for years, and now it ends. So you have 30 days to pack your things, find a place to live, take your child, and leave. I was building up anger, and I really wanted to take my feelings out on her. But I knew it wouldn't do any good. It wouldn't help much, and I had to think about my children first. It was very difficult to be calm and collected at that moment. I pushed the envelope across the table towards her. Here's the separation agreement. I've tried to be very fair to you. Go to a lawyer and look it over if you want. In fact, I would strongly encourage you to do so. But know this. I have no intention of owning your child as mine. I got up from the table and left the room. Silence enveloped the house. So for the next month, things were as normal as they could be in my house, considering my wife and her baby were about to leave. She actually started looking for an apartment and found a two-room apartment near her office. Her maternity leave gave her time to move and get settled before returning to work. The separation agreement laid out deadlines for various steps, and I reminded her from time to time that her time to move out was approaching. We walked through the house and she told me what she wanted to take with her to decorate her apartment. I took all the pictures that were around the house and put them away, especially the ones that had her in them. I made some notes about what I wanted to change in the house after she left. During this time, I kept my relationship with Amanda separate from Laura. In fact, I wasn't even sure if Laura knew that I knew Amanda. I continued to meet with Amanda a couple times a week, and on the weekends we would often do activities with our kids. Walking through parks and visiting local entertainment venues was a pleasant break for me. The kids who were a year older loved it. Amanda was curious as to what Laura would do. She asked me what my plans were after the six months of the separation agreement expired. I was honest with her and said that I very much doubted the possibility of reconciliation. Laura hasn't said much to me for a long time, unless it concerns my children. My plan was to move on to divorce. I pursued the separation agreement at Lee Ann's recommendation, primarily for the sake of the children and both of our families. My mother in Arizona couldn't care less what I did, but I knew Laura's family hoped I could forgive Laura and be a father to her child. For me, it all came down to respect. Without respect, there is no marriage and no relationship. Without respect, I could not call her my wife. I couldn't trust her to have my or the children's best interests at heart, and I knew I wouldn't have her best interests at heart. No, the marriage is over. Amanda watched me closely. She knew I was hurting and vulnerable, but at the end of the day, I knew I had to move slowly, take care of my children, and make sure they had a stable home and life. And that's what I did. Six months later, Laura. I've been living for a while now in this apartment. Jim agreed that I would bring enough furniture to make the place cozy. He gave me the furniture from the master bedroom, a lot of kitchen utensils, dishes, and a table and chairs for the kitchen. 
After the movers packed all my belongings, I looked around the house and realized that I would miss this home. I will come back here again to leave my children, but I will never live here again. It hurt to realize that my stupidity had cost me my family, my home, and the life I thought I would always have. Why couldn't I just keep my legs together around men I found attractive? At the time, I thought I could have sex with them, and as long as it was kept a secret from Jim, there was no problem. Everything was going great. Until I got pregnant. Now I'm almost a single mother in a two-room apartment. I have no time for a social life. I haven't had sex in months. I have to go back to work next week, and that means the baby will need daycare. My family almost stopped communicating with me. People at my work looked at me strangely when I visited the place a few weeks ago. I was never able to lose the post-pregnancy weight as quickly as I would have liked. And money is tight. I had to give up the rented Mercedes, and now I have a Volkswagen. I noticed Jim was still driving his Subaru. Some things do not change. He is the same stable rock that I am used to. I expect the divorce papers will be delivered to me soon. The separation agreement expires in a couple of weeks. And as far as I can tell, Jim has no intention of forgiving me and getting back together. I tried to talk to him about it the last time I saw him when he brought the kids over for the weekend, but he just looked at me and walked away. I understand what he is saying about respect. I'm just starting to understand this, but it's too late, Amanda. Well, it's time for me to act. The man I want is now divorced from his ex-wife and is settling into the role of a single parent easily. Jim is so organized that he can manage the kids, his job, the house, and even a little bit of his social life. His social life was mostly spent with me and my children, and that suits me completely. We spend a lot more time together and do things almost like a family. The kids and I spend more time at Jim's house, sometimes staying over the weekend. I realized what I lost with Michael, and I don't want to make the same mistake with Jim. Michael was a good man and would be a great father to my children. It's a shame he's not their father. My sense of self-esteem was so enormous that it overwhelmed common sense, and I thought that I could have everything at once. So I had an ongoing relationship with several different men and ended up getting pregnant twice. When Michael found out and confronted me, I closed off and refused to talk to him. So he left and told me that if and when I was ready to tell him the truth, I would have to call him. I was so embarrassed that I didn't call, and, well, he stopped waiting. Eventually, when I was able to muster up the courage to talk to him, he moved on and found a woman who loved him and only him. I was so stupid. I more, I won't repeat this mistake. Now the man I wanted is free, both mine and I his. A new circumstance has appeared. Jim. So now I'm divorced. I am a single father of two growing children. I am a lawyer specializing in business and tax law. It's boring to death, but the pay is very good. I work from home part of the time, so I can be with my children during all the important moments. I get home around 4.30 to make dinner and help with homework and the many activities they participate in. Laura sees her children less and less. She's back at work, and with the challenges of motherhood, she has little time to see her other children. I would remind her that she misses her kids and that she needs to make time for them. But with her real estate agent schedule and open house weekends, it means she spends less time with them. There's not much I can do about it, so I plan a lot of outdoor activities for us. Amanda and her kids are with us a lot of the time, and if you didn't know better, you'd think we were one big, happy family. And then everything changed. Amanda. All signs and symptoms are there. This morning, my usual cup of coffee that I drink to start the day didn't want to stay in. Crap. My head was in the toilet when breakfast suddenly returned. I washed my face, freshened up, and then got the kids ready for school. On the way to the office, I stopped at a nearby pharmacy and bought a test kit. You know which one. Part of my brain was saying, holy shit, I'm fucking crazy, because I knew what that meant. My breasts felt a little swollen and my period was late. I don't have difficult periods anyway, and to be honest, I forgot about them. Nervously, I hid the test kit in my briefcase and went to work. All day I thought only about going home and taking the test. When I finally returned, I waited until the kids went to bed and then went to the bathroom and closed the door. I don't know why I closed the door, since my bathroom is connected to the master bedroom, but I closed it anyway, 
After taking a deep breath and exhaling, I took it out of the package and got ready for the test. I held it under the stream and then set it aside to let it do its magic. I cleaned up and went down to the kitchen. Why, I don't know. I was nervous. If the test shows what I think it will, it will be a very important moment in my relationship with Jim. This will be a make-or-break moment. I returned to my bathroom and, with shaking hands, picked up a small piece of white plastic. Oh, my God. Laura. Damn loaf. Seriously, I need sex urgently. I'm so horny, and I really need it. I've thought about trying to talk to Jim and get him to come back to my bed, but the man won't talk to me. What should I do? Jason, my constant lover, left a few months ago. I heard he was dating a senior from university and they were getting serious. She must be careful. Between the child and work, I have no free time for a social life. I don't want to go clubbing with work friends because it's impossible to know what I'm under whether you're hooking up with a decent man who's good in bed or a serial killer. Really, what can I do? So I decided my husband would be a safe bet. I still love this man. He is the father of my two children, and I know that somewhere deep down, he still cares about me. I decided I had nothing to lose by trying to talk to Jim. I had to plan this carefully. I needed us to meet in a neutral place and not take the child with us. So I decided to invite him to meet me for a meal at a restaurant that I knew he loved. This place in the city center is called Beer Barn. The title is a little misleading. It's a very stylish, if casual, place, with a good menu of Jim's favorites and a long list of beers. I knew he really loved this place, so I decided to invite him to meet there. I called him and asked to meet. Surprisingly, he agreed. We've barely exchanged a few words with each other since Emma was born, so I had to be very careful in how I approached this crucial meeting. This will be the last attempt to save a very broken marriage. The paperwork was done, but in my heart we still had a chance. As long as we have children as a common bond, we still have a chance. That and I still need it. Jim. I hesitated between going and not going to meet Laura. Finally, after my internal reflection, I decided that I should move forward from my frustration and talk to her. The children were my main concern, and this attempt by her to talk to me was perhaps about something she had to tell me. Although she could have easily communicated her concerns about the children through her lawyer or even called me, I suggested that we could act like adults and talk face to face. So I decided to meet her at the beer barn, but I decided to take help with me. Laura. When I arrived at the beer barn, I saw that Jim was already there. He was with someone else, a woman. She was blonde and very attractive. They sat opposite each other. They held hands. Crap. As I approached the table, they stood up and she moved to Jim's side. The introductions were a bit awkward, as you can imagine. I didn't expect anyone else to be with him. Jim's expression was calm, and he had a smile on his face. I realized that my attempt to get him to come back to bed with me and the baby and I to move back in with him and the kids was completely lost. Jim ordered me a drink and took it upon himself to order food for all of us. He knew this woman, Amanda, well enough to know what she liked to eat. Double bummer. Once the food was ordered and the drink arrived, Jim began, So, Laura, what did you want to talk about? I stuttered and stammered, trying to come up with something stupid. I talked about kids and what I wanted to do with them during the times I have them for the next few months. Jim said he was planning something for Christmas, and that might mean taking them to a ski resort in Vermont. I simply nodded and agreed with almost everything he mentioned. I didn't notice before, but when Amanda took off her volume a new sweater, it became obvious that she was pregnant. My eyes widened as I stared at her stomach. Her pregnant belly wasn't very big, but it was noticeable. I knew these signs all too well. Laura, I have to tell you now that I'm selling the house. You'll get your half of the money after the mortgage is paid off to the bank. You see, Amanda and I are going to move in together, and we've decided that we want to move to a better house. We'll satisfy our needs. Jim let the news sink in. And then, with a huge smile on his face, he continued, Amanda is pregnant, 
We're expecting a baby in five months. Thus, the death bell sounded for my marriage, and any slightest hope of reconciliation I might have had melted away right before my eyes. I think it really started when I first started cheating with Jason, and then it accelerated like crazy when I spent those four days with Glenn in Vegas. I hoped the ground would open and swallow me right then, but that did not happen. I simply nodded at them and quietly said, I need to go. I left the restaurant and got into a taxi to go back to my apartment. I was so stunned that I forgot my car was parked nearby. Crap. In a year, Amanda. Okay, I guess I'll get the last word. The new house is furnished, and we have room for all the children. We bought a house in a great neighborhood, not far from the house Jim had. It's actually a little larger than the previous one, and we installed the pool before we moved. Between Jim, a newborn, and four kids running a home and work, I go to bed at night exhausted, but I try to be close to my husband. Yes, we got married. Jim insisted that our children have legally married parents. We got married shortly before the baby was born. We sleep naked, which means we make love almost every night. In this situation, I will soon become pregnant again. We still have a nanny who takes care of the baby while we're at work, and looks after the kids after school. Please know this. I learned a lesson from my first marriage. I know I was stupid and took Michael for granted. I didn't give him enough respect. I won't make this mistake again. I am very devoted to my husband and family. I can't believe how happy I am right now. I'm happier than I probably deserve. Jim is such a caring father to all of our children. I love this man so much and I know he loves me. Three years ago, I could never have predicted such an outcome. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.